Um, our next speaker is from the National Museum of the Philippines, um, who will speak to us on the Santa Cruz uh, shipwreck, um, a reflection on the practice of underwater archaeology in the Philippines. Um, Bobby. Um, what I will discuss today is uh, some sort of case study of uh, what has been done in the Philippines, which is a reflection on the overall underwater archaeology practice in the country. So we start with, uh, for those who are not familiar with the location of the Philippines, it's a uh, Southeast Asian map. Well, the Philippines is um, located in the eastern periphery, and it's uh, located by four large bodies of water. In the north, we have the Luzon Strait. And then in the east, we have the Philippine Sea, which is on the Pacific side. And then uh, on the west, the South China Sea, which the Philippines recently called the uh, West Philippine Sea. There has been much debate about it, <laughs> but um, that's for another topic. And then on the west is a uh, Celeb Sea. So a closer look at the Philippines uh, with some uh, facts about uh, related to underwater cultural heritage. It's composed of 7,107 islands. It has a coastline of 36,289 kilometers. They say it's more than twice the coastline of the United States of America. It has 51 principal river systems and more than 50 lakes. And the earliest human occupation presence is about 67,000 years ago during an excavation last year uh, at the Kalo Caves in northeastern Luzon. It's in um, Cagayan River, uh, Cagayan Valley. And then the earliest evidence for a watercraft is um, what we term as um, a balanghai, which is found in Butuan in uh, northeastern Mindanao. And that's a, uh, well, uh, um, artist concept of the Balanghai, which uh, was dated to about 4th century, but there's been a bit of a problem with the dating. And it's, it has to be verified again, but uh, archaeologists think that um, maybe the Balanghai is dated to the 13th century and not really the 4th century. And um, as for the historical background related to underwater cultural heritage, uh, well, the earliest recorded shipwreck investigation occurred in 1967. This was in northwest um, Luzon, but it was purely salvage efforts, and there was no supervision from any responsible government agency. But uh, through a Republic Act uh, 4846 and Presidential Decree 374, the National Museum was mandated as a government agency responsible for the protection and preservation of the country's cultural properties. And then the Underwater Archaeology Unit was created in 1979. This was through a Semio SPAFA um, training conference. And uh, during that time, there was no um, diving archaeologist or uh, maritime archaeologist, so it was staffed with people with backgrounds in engineering and zoology. So it wasn't really that great. And in 1982, an underwater policy was formulated. Prior to this, uh, we had a sharing. Uh, it was agreed that um, we work with private proponents who can uh, fund projects. And then initially it was 30% uh, for the government, 30% for the financier, and 30% for the lot owner. But this was based on land excavations. And as the underwater sites are government owned, so it was decided to have 50-50. So 50 for the government and then 50 for the uh, financier. So, during this policy guideline, everything was set um, as uh, all the guidelines were set, and then especially for the sharing methods also. So in 1988, the UAU was renamed the Underwater Archaeologist Section, which is headed by an archaeologist now, uh, Dr. Yusabi Lison, and he still remains the head of the Underwater Archaeologist Section. So. Since 1980s, we've done um, underwater archaeological excavations with private proponents, and these are some of the major excavations that we've done. So an example is the Pandanan shipwreck, which is found beneath a pearl farm um, in southwest Palawan. So on your left is a book, a pearl road. It's a little bit of a coffee table book, but uh, there are also some you know, um, scientific contributions there. And then on the upper right is the photo mosaic of the wreck itself. It's interesting because over 75% of the materials recovered 
where ceramics from Vietnam. So it's always like Chinese and uh, some Thai and then some Vietnamese. But this wreck uh, was very instrumental in, in elucidating that Southeast Asian uh, ships from Vietnam were also carrying trade activities in the Philippines. And you can see um, most of the stoneware jars from Vietnam and the boats from um, Chudao Kills, then some metal gongs and this very fine uh, Yuan uh, period Chinese blue and white bowl. And then the Lena Shoal, um, the book is called Lost Sea. It was excavated in 1997. It was looted first before the National Museum inter intervened. And then as you can see, it's very staged, uh, very nice cover. Um, most of the recoveries were uh, Chinese blue and whites dating to the uh, um, late 15th century to the early 16th century. And um, as you can see in one of the pictures, it's still um, in situ there. Here. And then there are some fantastic pieces like the ewers and the boxes here. And also a little bit of celadon from the Lunchuan. And this one is a, what remains of a shipwreck. And the San Diego, which is our most famous shipwreck so far, and this is the, the book. Um, the San Diego was sunk in December 14, 1600, after a naval engagement with the Dutch ship Mauritius. Um, it's significant because it's the first time that uh, the Spanish naval fleet had a battle with the Dutch ship. And there's another side of the story to this, in which uh, during this time, the San Diego was sunk, and then the Mauritius was victorious. And then after a few years, there was another naval engagement in which the Dutch was victorious, uh, the Spanish was victorious and the Dutch was defeated. And we're still trying to find that, that site, <laughs> like 15 years now. So um, it's, it's really nice because um, the San Diego, even if it was a warship, it was a refitted trade cargo. So much of its trade cargo still remained there. So it, it, it was really um, a very fine example of what uh, the maritime trade activities during the early Spanish period. So as you can see by the examples here, um, Chinese wares, and then uh, stoneware jars from Thailand and some from Burma, even uh, olive jars, and then terracotta or earthenware, and then of course uh, uh, pieces of egg. Oh, well, going back to the San Diego, um, it was widely, it was, it had a traveling exhibit all over the world. And it was very instrumental in having the National Museum complex now. Because after it was traveled, it had no home in the Philippines. So we had a big problem. Um, fortunately, the president of the Philippines during that time was very supportive of the project. So he made a law, the RA4846, which I will mention later, which basically sequestered three colonial buildings. That's that's for part of the National Museum complex. So, and the centerpiece was the San Diego wreck. It's located on the ground and the second floor, um, comprising three galleries, which is still there now. And then the Griffin, um, it's also nice. Uh, it was sunk in 1761. It was the first uh, East Indiaman that was um, excavated in the Philippines. And as you can see, it's still in its intact, it, it, in its intact position, and it was found during survey um, about two years. So they've had many months of, of survey work, and then they found it at the six meters under the seabed. So it, it's um, recoveries were basically uh, blue and white um, Chinese wares, but destined for the European market. And then the Royal Captain Shoal, um, which was sunk, another East Indiaman, uh, which sank in December 17, 1773. This is very interesting because it was found around uh, 350 meters uh, beneath the shoal. So they, they had surveyed and made test excavations and then found out that most of the materials were down. So what they did was uh, robots. Uh, robots excavated it at around 350 meters. And then, but they only took 5%, and the remaining 95% of the wreck was left intact, maybe because of, you know, very expensive to, to excavate this. And the, the bell was uh, found at uh, 460 meters below sea level. 
And um, as you can see, most of the materials are here. Um, it's again Chinese blue and white. Then we go now to the Santa Cruz uh, shipwreck, which is uh, like the case study of this uh, presentation. Um, the Santa Cruz municipality is located in the province of Zambales there, um, about 276 kilometers north of Manila. Uh, it was reportedly discovered in 1987, but it was looted uh, during the summer months of 2001. It was very interesting because it was election period in the Philippines, and you know, there was this news, other news, that there was a shipwreck looting, so it got the interest of, of many people. And then, um, I think more than 10 uh, compressor divers died during this one. Very, very um, dangerous, because everybody was there. You know, you can see like 10, 20 bankas going down, go up, go down, between plates. But uh, officially, it was only three, three, three fishermen. So excavation was conducted by the National Museum and the Far Eastern Foundation for Nautical Archaeology from July 4 to September 7. And also interesting because the July to September is monsoon uh, season in the Philippines. So we had to endure um, two uh, storms and two uh, low pressure areas. But we couldn't really leave because uh, people are there. They, they were just. Um, waiting for us to go, and then they loot it. Even at night, they go. So the shipwreck was located about 250 meters from Hermana Menor Island, and lies uh, 32 meters below sea surface level, just here. Some snapshots of the wreck site itself. It's, it's really nice that the lower hull was uh, intact. And then as you can see here, that's a uh, iron uh, cooking cauldrons. And then most, uh, as you can see, uh, there are transverse bulkheads which contain different types of materials, still in its um, in situ um, context. And uh, you can see also here, packs and packs of um, blue and white bowls, still in its in, um, original packing position, and also celadons from which one. And then again, another view of another bulkhead, which composed of uh, stoneware jars and also blue and white porcelain. Uh, all in all, there were 14,965, well, accession numbers, but we recovered 200 sacks of uh, broken um, stoneware jar pieces, of which more than 8,000 pieces are intact. Um, we estimated that as high as 30% of the Santa Cruz wreck trade cargo was uh, looted before we really did some work. So ma majority of the cargo, about 98%, were blue and white porcelain, the celadon, stoneware jars, and uh, stoneware ceramics. So some snapshots of the excavation activities. So you can see that's a top layer, then slowly, slowly we expose it, still its original position. And then recording of all the artifacts uh, recovered. And then um, for most um, artifacts, we do the tagging uh, um, underwater. So here, most of them have tags. And then the lifting up. And then uh, just the representative samples of the recoveries of the Santa Cruz. Um, the Chinese blue and white um, dishes of different designs, sorry, uh, different uh, types of bowls, blue and white bowls, also Chinese, and then small teacups and small jars. Uh, it's interesting because most of the teacups were found it look inside the big uh, stoneware jars. And then, uh, well, more exquisite shapes like the pen boxes, the round boxes. Then of uh, candies and then um, crescent shape. I was told that um, there was one or two pieces of this kind that was sold in the United States for a few hundred thousand dollars, which I, I don't know if it's true or not. But it tells you about the value of these things. And then a double duck uh, pouring vessel and candy. 
And then these are some examples of the Vietnamese blue and white wares also recovered from the Santa Cruz uh, bowls uh, and small jars. And then um, Celadon from Wung Chuan, very, very good examples also, um, different types. And um, also different types of bowls. This is a big, deep bowl, and there are smaller ones. And then this one is, uh, they call it incense burner. And then um, brownwares or stoneware jars from China. This, we had, a, I, well, I did my master's on this, and I had a little bit of a problem with this type. Because I've asked three, uh, six ceramics experts, and they, three said comes from Vietnam. And then three said comes from China. So um, I don't know. And um, some examples of um, celadon. These are from Thailand. And initially, this was um, uh, identified as from Thailand. But these are from Burma, from the Tuante Kings in Burma. And again, examples of um, celadons from Thailand. It's five minutes, so I have to go faster. And this, this one is a, a little bit interesting, because th these are candle holders. And then Dr. Roxana Brown identified it also as from the Twenty Kiln. Then some examples of the stoneware and um, earthenware. And um, storage jars from um, Sawang Kalok and Main Amnoy Kilns. And then these are examples of Vietnamese um, stoneware jars, which is really, really nice. And these are just one piece for each type. And then other uh, Chinese coins, um, Lantaka, bronze gongs, um, tin ingots, bronze bangles, then glass bracelets, carnelian beads, uh, stone grinders. And then this one, the last one, I don't know what that is. So maybe somebody can tell me. <laughs> so that's the site plan of the Santa Cruz wreck. And then that's a uh, uh, the recording of the shipper call. And then it's, it's a combination, it's it, the South China Sea tradition, it's a combination of the South China Sea tradition, which uh, Dr. Flecker is, is a, an expert. And it incorporates the Chinese and the Southeast Asian shipbuilding method, which is using of the dowels, wooden dowels, but also using uh, nails, and also with the transverse bulkheads. It's a, these are distinctly Southeast Asian, and the bulkheads and the nails are um, of Chinese uh, boat construction technology. So example there. And then a cross section, a three, three um, planking hull. And then there's a 3D representation after that. And then this was published in the French National Geographic. So fantastic. <laughs> so um, what can we be observed in this, in this kind of, um, well, the underwater cultural heritage is protected by at least four um, legislation measures. Um, RA 4846, or Cultural Properties Preservation Protection Act, which I can't be, you know, uh, can't really define with the last time available. And also the RA 4892, the National Museum Act. And then more recently, the RA uh, 10,066, which is the Natural Cultural Heritage Act of 2009. So, the, the most important thing about this um, cultural heritage is that they say that all cultural properties of the Philipp uh, belong to the Filipino people could not uh, could only be um, exported as, as uh, for scientific research or exhibition, so no sale. And then 2000, 2001 convention, um, the Philippines has been um, actively participating in it in 1993, 2003 Asia Pacific Workshop. And then also in 2009. And then last year, my boss was uh, assigned uh, to write on the Rule 26 and 27 on the UNESCO Annex. And then, well, one of, one of the objectives of the UNESCO is to develop um, professionals, in which there were three foundation courses that my colleague, uh, maybe Erpen Bacharanko from Thailand, will expound on it. So there were three foundation courses and one advanced course. And that was attended by uh, delegates from Southeast Asia. Central Asia and the Pacific. And well, besides learning archaeology, we had a grand time. Uh, just, it was a fun um, training program. And then hindrances um, so far. Well, the National Museum is the only, not the only government agency 
that's concerned with the UNESCO Foundation, but also the Department of Foreign Affairs, which is a bigger office. And unfortunately, um, the UCH is not their priority right now. So they're more on the biodiversity. So we're trying to initiate um, talks with them. And then some concluding remarks. Well, we've had major success, uh, shipwreck excavation success, and there has not been any auction, but there's a need to still enhance public awareness and then need to tap other stakeholders, such as the diving community and also the local community. And there's a need to undertake collaborative work with academic and research agencies. No more time. Thank you.